So you've heard from uh, South African young people just now about the, uh, a lot of the issues that they're facing in their lives here in South Africa. Uh, we have just heard from Alana Solomon, who works for ActionAid, telling us about how those same issues are being played out over and over again all over Africa and a lot of develop, developing countries. Uh, we're here at the UN Climate Talks uh, in Durban, South Africa, where the world has come together to try and find some solutions to these problems. Uh, we've got rich countries on one side, poor countries on the other side. They're all trying to work together to find the money, find the, the ideas that can, that can really uh, stabilize our climate and, and come to some answers. So now we go from, from the developing country to the developed country. We've got Alex Stark with us. Uh, Alex is with the International Adopt and Negotiator Program. Uh, and basically, uh, well, why don't you tell us? What does that mean? What are you doing here? Yeah, well, first of all, you should visit our website. It's a blog, www.adoptandnegotiator.org. Which um, is being blocked out by your negotiator who, yeah. who you pinned on your chest. Yes, I have his face. Why, his have you pinned that, why have you pinned that guy on your, on your chest today? Well, uh, so we're, Adopt and Negotiator is a group of young people from different countries all over the world. There are about 10 of us. Um, here and we're following uh, our country delegations at the UN climate talks to kind of find out what's going on, um, maybe influence their positions a little bit, but also to help explain to people back home what's going on here because it can be so technical and complex. There, It's like an alphabet soup of acronyms. Um, so that's basically what we're doing here. I'm following the US delegation. I'm from the US. Uh, I live in Washington, DC. And I have this button, this handy button on my chest because I'm following, this is the head um, US negotiator. His name is Jonathan Pershing. And um, you've made a button out of his face. Yes, <laughs> I have. Uh, I was chatting with him the other day and he made a, a little joke about how we should wear you know, pins with the face of the people that we're tracking because you, you can see us darting around in our T-search like chasing after our, our delegates and they're kind of scuttling away. Um, and so I thought it would be funny to actually make a button. Did you make a button with your face on it for him? No, but that's an excellent idea. Take that into consideration. All right, good. Well, so your job here is to follow the U.S. negotiators, figure out what they're doing here, what, what's going on, and report back to people about it. So uh, report back to us now. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is what's being called a long-term agreement, a, a long-term legally binding agreement. Mm -hmm. um, basically, the issue here is that we've got the Kyoto Protocol. We've had that in place for a certain amount of years. The U.S. isn't a party, but many other countries are. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the only legally binding treaty we have that deals with climate change right now. And that's ending. At the end of next year, that's ending. Mm -hmm. So we're looking what happens after the Kyoto Protocol. We need a new treaty, right? Right, exactly. Um, so there are really two tracks of negotiations going on here. There's the Kyoto Protocol, as you said. It expires in, in the end of 2012, and so the countries that are uh, party to that treaty are trying to find a new a way to have a new commitment period. Um, so they like it and they want to continue it? Some of them. Uh, the EU does, certainly. Other countries, Japan, Canada, Russia, have said that uh, they're not interested in a second commitment period. Um, on the other hand, there's the uh, Long-Term Cooperative Action Track, LCA, alphabet soup, like I said, um, and they're looking to find some kind of new treaty. No one's really sure what form it will take, whether it will merge with Kyoto, whether it will be separate, um, but something that will really bind all of the emitters, including uh, the United States, which, as you said, is not a party to Kyoto. But they're not trying to work out the details of that new treaty here, right? <laughs> they're trying to work out the details of how they're going to work out the details, essentially. They're um, looking at what general form that will take, so kind of the end goal, and then um, they're trying to come up with a mandate to negotiate that treaty. So basically, the, the big win at the end of next week for this issue would be that they would come together and say, yes, we agree to negotiate this yes. out, and we, are, we, we want a new treaty, and we have a plan now to sit down and negotiate it? Yeah, that's it. It's kind of anticlimactic, isn't it? And I think <laughs> one of the problems with trying to explain uh, what's going on at the UN Climate Talks is that it's so bizarre and convoluted, and there aren't really any that many exciting outcomes where you can say, here, we accomplished something. Um, but that would be the first step to a, a massive new yes. climate treaty. And it, actually, it would be a major accomplishment coming out of these talks. So um, is the US on board? Are they, are they ready to sit down and, and start negotiating a new treaty? Uh, in theory, they're on board, but there are a couple of conditions that they've put in place. And they've said they won't sign on to a new treaty unless these certain conditions are met. Like, for example, give us one. Yeah, one of the, um, the most important issues that came up um, two years ago in Copenhagen and then last year in Cancun um, is the idea of legal symmetry, which essentially means that the U.S. is saying 
fine, we'll be part of a legally binding treaty, but we also want um, certain other emerging, rapidly growing economies that are emitting more and more greenhouse gases. Is that code for China and India? Yeah, essentially China and India. <laughs> and um, maybe Brazil, South Africa, Indonesia, some other countries. Um, they want those countries to also make legally binding commitments, mm. and those countries have essentially said that they won't, um, at least before 2020. So, but that seems fair. I mean, if you're going to go into a treaty um, and say, oh, we're going to cut our emissions, why wouldn't you want the other people in the treaty to say, oh, yeah, we agree to be bound by, uh, to cut our emissions also? Well, that's the United States argument. Um, the other side, those countries and some other developing countries uh, argue that um, developed countries, the U.S. and the EU, are historically um, the ones who have contributed to climate change. They're historical emitters. Um, they're the most responsible for climate change. Um, they're also obviously much more developed than countries like China and India, even though they're growing rapidly, their GDPs are growing, um, they, they still um, are developing. There, there's a lot of poverty, obviously, and, and issues to deal with around poverty. And so it's hard to really put a lot of resources into cutting emissions. So if we can really make it sort of uh, simpler than it truly is, we could say the U.S. wants China to come to the table, China and India and those countries to come to the table and say, we're going to cut our emissions and we're going to be legally bound to do it uh, if you come to the table and agree to be legally bound to cut your emissions. Yes, very broadly. Yep. Why doesn't China say, sure, we'll do it? Um, well, as I said, they, um, they argue that they don't have the resources, they're not developed yet. They say maybe, China at least has said, not so much India, um, maybe by 2020 we'll be ready for this, but we're not really ready right now. But uh, what I don't understand is why now? Why can't they start negotiating and talk all this stuff out? Why is the U.S. saying, oh, we're not even going to start negotiating a treaty until you agree to the negotiations of, to these these things? That sounds to me like they're negotiating before the nego negotiations start. Well, I, you know, to editorialize, I think they are. I think that's what's going on. Not certainly on the part of the United States, and the United States is often um, accused of blocking the negotiations here deliberately by putting in place conditions and doing things like that. But I think at the end of the day, um, every country comes here with their own interests in mind and the official statements that they make and the things that they say are can't quite be taken at, at face value every time. Sometimes um, it, it's kind of concealing interests. So in a sense, there may be there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that they're not really telling us. and. Mm -hmm. Will that ever come out? When when will we find out what has been going on behind the scenes? Well, I think you can you can take a look around and, and kind of understand what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, for example, in the United States, uh, we don't have any nationally um, national legislation to cut emissions. We tried to get um, cap and trade legislation in 2009 that failed. It didn't pass Congress, um, and so I think part of the issue is that. We, we still have this very conservative Republican Congress in office right now, and it really doesn't look like um, any kind of climate change legislation is going to pass. Um, and so it's really hard to come to the table at an international negotiation and say we're willing to make those commitments um, without you know, some kind of backup or to prove how we're going to get there. It sounds like... Um well, I know, let's start here. Barack Obama said in his campaign several years ago for presidency, he would if elected, re-engage in these talks and become a positive uh, force mm -hmm. in, in the UN climate change treaty process. Uh, and that hasn't happened. Uh, not as much as many people had hoped, certainly. Um, I wasn't in Copenhagen in 2009, but I, I heard a story about how Todd Stern, who's the head, head negotiator for the US, uh, stood up in plenary and said, we're back. And everyone stood up and applauded, and there was a lot of excitement. Um, really hope that the US would come to the table in good faith. Um, but I think just like many other issues in the United States, um, not just climate change, um, the Obama administration hasn't quite satisfied all of its supporters. Mm -hmm. So the, the U.S. domestic politics play a huge role Absolutely, here yeah. thousands of miles away in Durban, South Africa. Mm -hmm. Um, is what, what can Americans do who have an opinion, who, who care about this stuff, what can they do to make a difference? Well, uh, I live in Washington, D.C., and I'm kind of a policy nerd. <laughs> so I would always say go to Congress, write letters, um, call your representatives um, and your senators, tell them this is an issue you care about, um, tell them to, you know, fund... Does that really work? It does, yes. I actually, 
fun story, I used to be a lobbyist for a nonprofit organization and I worked on these issues. I, you know, spoke with members of Congress, I worked with grassroots folks back home, and it really does work. They take they take into account what their constituents say because, you know, you're the voters at the end of the day. That's how they got into office. So um, so if people care, that's what they can do. Um, but Coming back into these negotiations here, it comes down to what this guy Todd Stern and this guy Mr. Pershing, what they do in the rooms. Mm -hmm. um, are you optimistic that there that there's going to be a shift? I'm not optimistic that there's going to be some kind of huge shift here. Um, I think the best, for example, in terms of activism or lobbying, the best way to go about influencing the U.S. position here at the international talks is um, to focus on what's going on back home. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. How do you feel and when you uh, think about, we've already heard the election campaigning has begun, especially on the Republican side. Uh, there's a lot of posturing now. Um, people, There's been a lot of talk that Barack Obama is starting to take decisions based on the next campaign rather than based on you know maybe the other important factors in a particular decision. Uh, do you sense that in the states? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think a really good example is the uh, tar sands action that's been going on. There's a proposal to build a tar sands pipeline from Canada um, through the U.S. to refineries in the, in the south of the U.S. And the tar sands are where in Canada where there's this huge amount of oil under, right. under these sandy areas mm -hmm. and they can extract that and mm -hmm. send it to refineries in the United States to be turned into fuel. Exactly. Um, so the problem is the way that they extract that is um, really greenhouse gas emission intensive. Also, obviously, when it's burned, it releases more greenhouse gases. And that the pipeline itself, there could be um, spills in these really pristine environmental areas. Mm -hmm. um, so people are really up in arms about this. The climate movement has been kind of coalescing around it. Um, there was an action actually outside of the White House a few weeks ago that I was able to attend, which was really inspiring actually. There were, I think, more than 10,000 people who actually surrounded the White House um, to protest and to ask the Obama administration uh, not to approve a permit to build the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Overall, are you disappointed in the Obama administration's first three years? That's a, that's a tricky question. Um, I think a lot of people had almost unreasonable expectations for what he could accomplish just because um, a lot of us were very disappointed with the prior administration and it felt like it was so bad that this was a new beginning and everything was going to be great but actually um, you know every president or every presidential administration comes into office in a context of um, you know politics and, and economics and whatever and in this case you know there is um, a global economic downturn that had to be dealt with there's um, now a Republican um, House in office, so it's really hard to pass things through Congress. Um, and I, I think certainly I'm disappointed in, in certain um, decisions that he's made. For example, I, I think it would be great if he rejected the um, tar sands permit outright instead of putting it off until actually after the 2012 election. Um, but overall, I think it's hard to say, you know, yes or no. So, jury's still out. Um, here in Durban, um, what would what would represent uh, a positive outcome at the end of next week? What are you looking for to see here? Um, well, there are two really big issues that most people are following. Um, one, as you said, the long-term agreement for a legally binding um, emissions regime. And so people are looking again for a mandate to negotiate, not necessarily an actual treaty. That doesn't seem likely at all. Um, but it would be great if parties could at least decide that we need a new treaty it would be even better if they could decide that we need a new treaty now or as soon as possible. Um, the United States and China and some other countries have been saying, well, actually, you know, maybe by 2020 we'll have a treaty, which is uh, disappointing. So a good outcome would be um, 2015 or even earlier. And the other issue that we're looking Wait, at... Wait, before we go into the other issue, I want to ask a, a very basic question. Why do we need a treaty? Uh, to reduce emissions. I mean, broadly... Um, you know, the U.S. and others have argued that we can go around country by country, each making our own voluntary pledges to reduce emissions. Um, but unless everyone acts, then there's kind of a, a commons problem um, where there's no, there's no motive to act. If others are reducing emissions, they're kind of doing the work for you. And so no one takes a step forward. If everyone can take a step forward together, um, that's, I think, the only way that we can really solve the problem. So sort of people feel confident take, you know, spending a little money to do the things they need to do if they know that everyone else is doing it too. Yeah, confidence building measures essentially. And is that other major issue here, does it have to do with money? Yes, it does. <laughs> Funny you should say that. Um, it has to do with the Green Climate Fund that was created last year in Cancun. Um, and it's a fund to direct 
um, money from developed countries to developing countries to help them um, with mitigation activities, so ways that projects that they can use to reduce emissions and also adaptation, so um, the ways that they can adapt to the effects of climate change that we're already seeing. Um, and so they created the fund in theory and they spent the, about the past year, uh, a special committee has been discussing um, basically what that fund would look like, how it would be governed, you know, how the money would flow through it. And so we're hoping that this year in Durban they'll be able to agree to actually set up the fund. Okay, we've uh, we've talked a lot about that fund today, so we're definitely going to be going to be keeping an eye on that. Um, we'd love to have you back over the course of this next ten days, Alex, to sort of keep us posted on what these guys are up to. Sure. Um, are you going to get a chance to meet with them directly again? How does how does that process work? How do you how do you follow them? Um, well, I hope I'll get to meet with them directly again. That was it was a really helpful meeting. Um, but everything is incredibly chaotic here. People are running back and forth, and especially. Um, you know, as things progress and, and the negotiations get more intense, there's going to be a lot going on, you know, behind behind closed doors and so forth. But if I if I can't, you know, pin them down to meet with them, you will see me, or you can read on my blog about me chasing them, you know, to at www.adoptanegotiator.org. Yeah, check it out. Okay, so we'll keep we'll keep an eye on that. We'll keep an eye on how things are progressing here. Uh, we'll continue uh, at OneClimate.net. We'll continue bringing you the latest news from here uh, at the UN Climate Talks in Durban. Um, earlier today, there was a press conference that was given by the uh, the Climate Action Network. It's an umbrella group of many organizations. I think it's over 700 organizations around the world who work on climate change issues, and they really keep a, keep track as the as these uh, negotiator trackers do as well. They're really keeping track of what's going on inside these rooms and behind the closed doors, and trying to pull out those bits and pieces of information to let you know where the talks are on any particular day. So we're going to hopefully um, bring you that press conference in just a minute uh, if we have it queued up here. Um, they talk every day uh, and just give sort of a, 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 a where we are statement. Um, so we're going we're gonna to take a look in now at that press conference uh, and then we'll be back in a few minutes uh, after that just to close things out here from Durban.